Welcome back to Siam Smoke Sessions. This is finally episode 20. What is 20 in Thai, Sita? Oh, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared. You need to start learning your Thai. At least your numbers. Uh, we've got someone... Uh, uh, well, we've not just someone. We've got a great guest here lined up who we're going to introduce here in a moment. Uh, but Sita, I've got a quick question for you. Okay, I'm ready. Shoot. All right. What was the we do so to the guest and everyone listening? I do, do just these kind of like just general trivia questions about Thailand, just to keep Sita on his toes a little bit. <laughs> uh, so, what was the capital of Thailand before Bangkok? Oh God, um, uh, Ayutthaya. Wow, you finally got one right, Sita. Hey, I love that place. I've been there many times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got a fucking winner. Well, let's jump into this because. I don't know what Sita's been smoking. I've been smoking this mango haze stuff I got um, uh, here in Chiang Mai. I have smoked our guest weed. Uh, at least, I think it was nine different um, uh, strains um, I had tried from him. But let's just jump right into this. Sita, why don't you introduce our, our guest for today? Okay, I'm sorry, Bill, but I'm going to simp just a little bit. Just a, just a little bit. I have to admit, I think this guy is the farang of fire in thailand just saying no offense to the other farangs out there but we today we have m also known as infamous gardens on the podcast so welcome to the podcast man how you doing i'm doing very well gentlemen and yourself and doing good it's an early morning in england but i'm good so yeah welcome to the podcast man it's been really like wanted to get you on because you know you are, as the name says, a bit infamous in the scene, you know, I I <laughs> don't really know many people growing as much variety as you, especially outdoor and stuff, so I give you massive kudos for that, man. Oh, thank you, guys. It's uh, It's been a wild journey. Being so infamous has not always been a, a benefit in this industry, especially in Asia, so uh, it's kind of nice to finally be able to come out of the shell a little bit and get out there you know so definitely man. Well, let, let me ask you okay so about that because i'm kind of curious so when that first day happened june 9th you probably had anticipated that because you were kind of oh so before june 9th well i guess i should like back it up i started yeah. here at around 2019 2020 okay um legally with hospitals universities and different places for research and making the Thai traditional medicine and things like that. And then I, st I did, I helped with um, another very famous person, Baba Fats, and He's up in Rosin, we did uh, the pilot project mm -hmm. in Chiang, in Lampang, sorry. Okay. Near Chiang Mai, and that was just before COVID started. So I guess that was, what year was that? 2020? And so then, yeah, after that, I was working in the scene ever since. Um, at one point, I had a hydro store that was like, you know, all local Thai supplies um, from all local Thai vendors, all for growing cannabis. And uh, due to some personal reasons, that had to end. But all this was pre <laughs> the ninth. Okay, so this is all stuff that has happened way before the ninth even happened. So when when you talk about anticipation, like they had a big festival here in 2019 where they gave everyone grow licenses for 90 days. And that's in Buriram, right? Yeah, in Buriram. Okay, so yeah. Buriram's always been kind of like a safe haven. <laughs> yes. And uh, so... That's one of the reasons why I'm here. I have this shop here, and, uh, you know, lots of different reasons why Buriram is the spot. There's political reasons why. Right. There's, like, some different environmental reasons why Buriram is good, but it's always been a little bit safer here. So, yeah, working here with that, they had the big festival where a whole bunch of people came. They gave out licenses, and on that day, I was like, okay, this is going to go legal any minute. Uh, it felt like I was like waiting for it, like ever so since that time. It was in you know? the air, like you, it was you, you, you had the hunch. It was pretty obvious. 
Yeah, and uh, there was all these medical licenses growing around. So there were actually grows getting put up, plants getting put in the ground. Um, there was very little knowledge. So it was like, felt like a very ripe market. But of course, there was no market. There were, it was all just for research and kind of just playing with it. Nothing like it is now, you know? Right. And then I was working with a farm and we did a bunch of clones. So June 9th, everything opened. June 10th, there was a festival here in Bury Run. I must have sold like, oh man, thousands of plants that day. So many clones, it's crazy. Uh, we were the only ones there with any foreign genetics. Everything else was like hang a lock. You know what I mean? Like yeah, high stuff. squirrel tail shit. Yeah. 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 So people, there was people lined up to get their million plants. I'm sure you've talked about that. Yep. How they get a million plants? Well, this is where they were giving them out. So all these growers were coming, and here I am in like this little booth just banging out clones, and I had no idea the ferocity of what was going to ensue over that day. You know, it was madness. By the last day, we had, like, pickup trucks going to and from the farm nonstop. Just any plants we had, we were selling at any stage, you know. It was crazy. To Thai growers, mainly. Thai growers, foreign growers, everyone wanted plants, you know. Okay. It was was crazy. And even now... I was going to say, even now, a lot of the people that have bought those clones are really only now harvesting them. So there's lots of people I knew that did full-term plants with those clones, you know? So it's been a long time. And now everything's dried and cured, and we can talk about that in a minute. But now there's a whole lot of product on the market, you know? Sure. So it's... uh kind of funny how everyone started roughly during the same time so obviously everybody's harvesting roughly during the same time and yeah it's uh kind of crazy to see the way the market's gone so rapidly here so so since june 9th so you you were you were in it yeah you were growing uh with like the research stuff and the medical and then june 9th happens and then it just takes off like a rocket ship, and it pretty much hasn't stopped since then. Yeah, th- at that point, I said, forget it. I'm not going to do any more work with the, the people I was working with before, growing weed for the mental hospital for their research. I said, forget that. Me and my girl went, got all the licenses, got everything set up, and just did all of our own shit. You know what I mean? And uh, I've also been doing consulting and partnering with other farms, helping run their farms at the same time because there's only so much space one person can do. So, yeah, that's what's going on now. So, okay, so one thing, I what you just said about everyone kind of harvesting at the same time, the question is who can skillfully grow and cure and, and dry their weed and, and sell quality product? Because there's going to be a lot of people growing now. In different levels of operations, there's like you know small home growers. There's people that want to start farms. Like, what have you seen? Like with like people using the same genetics, let's say, like oh, like the shopping genetics, the sugar canes, and the right. same list of twelve different strains that everyone has. The bananium and the other few things. That, so, yeah, um, I don't know. It, right now, it's interesting to see that. Most people growing that I actually see are not necessarily even smokers. Right. Everyone's growing. Right. So there's there's just so much weed on every level that it's just absolutely ridiculous. And the only people buying weed really are in the tourist spots, you know? And any mass or the dispensaries buying, selling to tourists. Because in the local village areas, everyone's neighbor has a greenhouse growing weed. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's uh, it's crazy to see. But I think we'll see a lot of people fall off as the hype wears out. You know what I mean? Thailand's always big on hype. When Gratam came out, everyone became a Gratam farmer. Uh-huh. So obviously everyone's going to do the same with weed. And uh, 
The people that really love it, I think, will continue push through the hard times. The people who thought it was easy money will fade to the side. And the new regulations coming are going to change the way everything's being played now anyway. So, you know, I think there's going to be a lot more evolution in the market, especially when those rules come down. Mm. To be honest, I'm surprised it's gone so fairly unregulated as it's been. You know, it's been kind of like a wild time. Yeah, it seems like they can't figure out all the agreements of what they want to regulate. seems like there's too many kind of hands in the pot, like trying to get this or trying to stop this, or there's no agreement on it, it seems. Yeah, and, and no one's really, like, I want the government to start making some money on it so they can just leave everyone alone, you know what for I mean? For sure, for the sure. Problem is that the government's not getting their, their piece of it, and they're looking around saying everyone else is getting the money but the government. Right, and I think it will eventually go the same way it went in Canada. Though everything will have to be back certified and then packaged on site, like cigarettes and booze, with a tax ribbon band on the package, and eventually it's got to go out like that, so they can get taxed on the sale of each product. You know what I mean? For sure. So, um, I think it's just a matter of time before that becomes implemented, you know, and this deli style that we see goes out the window, these big jars in the shops. Right. I think we'll, this time, maybe in two years, once they get it figured out, I don't think we'll see the jars anymore. It'll be racks of Mylar bags, you know what I mean? It's kind of unfortunate because to me, like a like the whole point of like a dispensary experience is you get to kind of see and smell the weed before, you know... You're kind of going in blind if it's just in a sealed mylar, and it's it's. I mean, it it will probably go that way. But it, it was one thing I was talking to a friend of mine today about is like the whole like the whole like benefit of like going to be able to buy at a dispensary for a higher price, for example, is you do get to interact with the weed. You get to kind of smell the turps. You get to kind of take a look at it closer. You know, you can talk to the bud tender. You know, and it's more of an experience that way. But it will probably have to go, like you said. Well, it- in Canada, and I believe California, uh, it's not like that. For all the right. legal dispensaries in Canada, like I said, everything is packaged. There may be a bud on display right. for you to look at and get a little woof of it, maybe of a smell. But like overall, uh, you know, even in Canada, there's the, the legacy dispensaries, which obviously aren't abiding by the rules, but overall it's just all prepackaged. Right. For tax reasons, you know what I mean? Just to keep everything certified. And yeah. I know people who've opened up weed in Canada that's been sealed two years, and it's still not gone bad. I can't uh, say it's good, but it's it, it had not gone bad. You know what I mean? It was properly sealed with silica packs, and it, it's quite impressive sometimes to see what It wasn't all about. dusty and crumbly. <laughs> no, no, that's what I mean. It, it actually wasn't, like, totally fucked. It was, like... An aspect of it, like, I don't know, all the licensed weed in Canada is very mid-grade at best. So to say it was good was definitely not. But to say that it wasn't dusty and crumbly was uh, definitely not. So I think that uh, that will be a natural progression. Just, yeah. uh, But that's just my thoughts. Maybe I'm wrong. I've been wrong many times before. So No, it's, I think it's likely. Now, with, like, the weed you grow, now I've had... Uh, I think I've t- I tried like three of your outdoor and at least three of your indoor. The critical plus outdoor was for outdoor weed. The terps were some of the best I've had in time. I uh, have yeah. experienced. And to be totally honest, though, that that batch that you had was the first batch of uh, sun grown that we had come in. Sun grown. Okay. Yeah. Talk, so, talk about or that. outdoor, whatever you want to call it. I put two different brackets on it because we didn't have all the drying facilities and everything up 100%. So there was kind of some mishmashing. And, and in my eyes, we lost a little bit of quality on that. So when you see the, all the new stuff that we harvested with all of the dry rooms that were up 100%, you definitely see that in the quality, in the color, in the smell. So make sure uh, you check out some of the new stuff. 
Oh, I will be, my friend. I will be. Um, Sita, what what do you got for infamous? I, I was just gonna. I wanted to quote like quickly is like. Some people don't understand what sun grown means compared to like outdoor as a general umbrella term. So could you just like elaborate on that just a little bit? Well, you know, so there's to me, sun grown and outdoor, there's almost, you know, literally it means the same thing. One's grown outdoor, one's sun grown. But to me, the, the idea of outdoor is kind of like not so cared for, kind of more left to the elements, not so you just not as cared for as something that I would consider like sun grown is it's more instead of being indoor it's outdoor so you're literally in the plants every day taking care of it deeply monitoring everything that's going on versus just having a bunch of plants outside you know what I mean yeah that so makes sense completely thank you <laughs> And, and then, you know, then there's mixed lighting, obviously, which is a greenhouse that has assisted lighting to help on the output days. But th that's what I would consider. And, and some people may say, ah, oh, I'm just creating more definitions in an industry full of definitions. But I just think it helps signify because in Canada, I've seen fields that are as far as the eye can see that I, I wouldn't consider a craft grown product. There's no way someone's in there looking at that plant every day. You know what I mean? And sometimes when you've got just a sheer number, you know you're not looking at that plant every day. You know that it's just become a number a little bit on a list. And it's gotten to the point now where we had so many strains. My, I've got a box of samples upstairs, and there isn't even strain names on them anymore. We've got a legend of strain numbers and names and phenos and it's become so elaborate it's ridiculous and uh so i don't know i'm yabbering i'm stoned now so sorry guys no don't <laughs> it's good information man i think especially like now with thailand and stuff everyone's trying to make their own thing there's a lot of breeders like trying to find something that they can i, I don't blame them capitalize on or make a brand around you know like again i i i saw a meme the other day joking that they should classify sugarcane now as a thailand race because of how how prevalent it is in shops so it, it, like yeah it's funny you say that because when, when i talked to to in in-house that was the first thing i said was man your sugarcane is absolutely everywhere and it's just funny how to see how certain strains like the mimosa and the sugar cane have just taken off of popularity here where I just don't understand why. But I think it's just the availability of the clones that were out there. It was just so easy early on for people to get those sugar cane clones that it just showed up in every shop, you know. Yeah, I think now we're going to see a, definitely a lot more variety as more people are going to import genetics and seeds and stuff instead of just going by clones. I mean, when I look, I, as I said to Bill before the podcast, I don't think I've seen as big of a list of different strains by one group of people than I have from your list. It's like, people will know if you go on the Discord and see, like, stuff. I'm like, it makes me happy seeing how much variety you are growing out. Yeah, well, we've got... Yeah, for the outdoor, we did almost a hundred varieties of Jordan of the Island seeds mm. and if you see that list it's it's absolutely wild and so that's crazy and then you know we've got all the other people that I do the seeds for I've been running a lot of Humboldt seed company I did a whole bunch of Masonic um, who else did I do Ripper seeds is always in the list mm. um, HBK he's new to Thailand so I don't know if he created the Chile Verde, so I'm running a bunch of that stuff to go along. So there's a whole bunch of new flavors coming out, and uh, I'm really excited. And especially flavors that I like, like Duke Nukem and Romulan, that I really don't see anybody else putting out there. So I let everybody else fight for the gelatos if they just leave my Romulan alone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with that. Um, on previous episodes, I've been very much known as a gelato hater but it's just because I'm a, I am against kind of the bottlenecking of terpenes and stuff that a lot of dispensaries go down that route like the variety to me is very important mm -hmm. I, I feel you on that and it's 
And that's why when people say, watch your favorite strain, it's like, well, that's like saying, watch your favorite food. I can tell you what I want to eat today, right now. Exactly. But I probably yeah. don't want to eat that tomorrow for breakfast. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, I think variety is the spice of life. Sometimes you find things you fall in love with and you smoke it every day for a little bit and then you fall out of love with it just as quick. And then there's things that, you smoke every day, like to me, the Duke Nukem, man, if you can find me a better sativa to sit and you can smoke every day, you know, let me know, because to me, that's the one, you know, and there's just so many killer strains out there, that it's, it's hard to just stick with just a handful, but yeah. So do you... Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I okay, because you're you're getting people's appet you're wetting people's appetite here. We're talking about some solid dank weed that Infamous is growing. I've had a variety of his indoor and outdoor. Um, I would highly recommend it. But the question I have is, what are what, like, what's the best way people can? Because we've got people listening. Because we get like feedback from people. Like we've got people in the industry in Thailand. We have uh, shop owners. We have growers. So you can kind of speak to different audiences, but then there's you know a set of the people here who are listening that might be in Thailand. They're curious about your weed. What's the best way they can find like your weed or like what, oh, what would you God. recommend? Yeah. Um, recommend first of all go in and ask your dispensaries and the shops near you. Ask them if they have any weed from Infamous Gardens. Always do that, no matter if you you know th that that's what I think you should do because there are shops where it goes out to, and. Uh, I don't like to sit here and name drop because sometimes the, you know they may be near each other so I don't want to give this guy the heads up and forget the other guy's name so I'm not going to sit here and name the shops but go into your local ask if they got in from his garage most people will let you know if not message me on Instagram see the link tree in the Instagram you can find the discord and all the other stuff if you message me I'll uh, get you directed to what's nearest you and if not, we'll get you a box. So it's uh, it's not complicated. If you want it, you knock on the door. It'll open for you. Oh, I love it. I love that answer. Yeah. So but uh, the whole idea is I want to try to get it into the clubs. But if you're a local in Thailand, or you've got a shop here, best just hit us directly because that way you're going to save more than buying it from the shops. And uh, the shops got to earn their money, and I get it, but you can save a little bit and get it direct. I don't see why not. No, that's awesome. Like, thank you, man. Like, there's gonna, and there's a lot of p different people in different, like, like Bill said, layers of the community that always come to us and ask this stuff. So it's much appreciated for that. No, and, and to be honest, that's it. right now with the whole expansion of the industry and our operation. That's where. Uh, my scaling up has not been as successful as I want it to be, uh, especially when it comes to just talking to people, what? trying to teach you know people your your SOPs and what you want done on on your farm is extremely difficult, um, especially when you've got language <laughs> barriers and it can be so detail oriented it's the little tiny things that add up to make the big successes and wins in cannabis there isn't one formula you're going to feed at one time that's going to change the whole experience it's tons of little nuances that you're constantly doing that create the bigger effect and i believe that's what makes a a good grower from an average grower you know what i mean and uh it's hard to teach people those nuances without kind of micromanaging them, looking over their shoulder. And uh, the whole reason you're hiring people is so, you know, you're freeing yourself up to do something else. So it, I've just found it hard having people do stuff and then come back and see it's not done exactly the way I, I want it done and realizing it's my fault for not explaining it so thoroughly. So the this industry is has a, yeah, sorry. No, this is Thailand, my friend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a constant in my life as well. For yeah, everything everything we're doing up here in Chiang Mai, uh, yeah, for working with contractors, and the whole nine yards has been exactly what you just described. Which I guess leads me to my next question. Okay, so like, this is kind of like a business slash growing question. 
with what you're doing, like you had mentioned scaling up, is it, do you see the issue, like kind of what you're saying, it's like hard to like get your processes in, in, in place, maintaining quality, or is it a demand issue where it's hard, it's too hard to move, move weight on your end? Or is it uh, right thing? now? It's just having people maintain exactly how I want it to do up to my quality. You know what I mean? It, it, it it's so easy to do fire with a tent or a room it's so easy to do 10 plants perfectly when you're looking at them every day and you can basically wash every leaf with your hands and it takes no time at all and you can sit there and hand trip everything but okay now what do you do when you've got to take care of 5,000 plants you know, are, yeah. are you going to sit there? Are you going to go through and hand water each one every day now? Are you, what about even top dressing them? A, a, a two minute job in a tent has now become, okay, a four day exercise. So just scaling up and making sure everything's done to the same level as you would have done it if you were doing it with your own hands. You know what I mean? And so just realizing that there's a capacity in which, you know, you need staff to help you with stuff. And uh, my, my just learning about Thailand is realizing what I can delegate and what I can't, you know. And so while still maintaining quality. And maybe it's more of a, a training thing. More time on the job will obviously improve the staff. It's hard to demand perfection the first run. But, uh, yeah. These are just business issues. Uh, as far as moving weight goes, that's an interesting thing. It's, uh, it seems very weird. There was a hiccup where I felt like all the weed was just falling from the sky and the price was just continuously dropping. I don't know if you've ever seen that uh, chart I posted in the Discord that had the average price per gram since it started in the ninth. Yeah, right. I've and seen that, yeah. And uh, there's a clear direction of where that's going. Um, but even if you look at it, it's all done from a retail point of view. And there's really, you don't see a whole lot of grams under 500 out the shop, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, especially when it's supposed to be so competitive and you're not seeing shops really trying to focus more on volume rather than maintaining price, which I don't really see as the best way forward. It makes more sense for me for the shops to drop it, move it, get fresh product in, keep the menus moving. Um, and that's what I always suggest to the shops that I do. If anything's ever sitting there, you know, price it to sell because product that's sitting there doesn't doesn't bring new customers in. It doesn't create excitement. Things need to move. And I feel that people hug on to the price very, very tightly, this 500 batter gram thing. And it doesn't translate to what the farmers are getting by any aspects at all so it creates this false sense of fucking pricing in the market because i know so many farmers that are like they don't smoke they don't talk to anyone they grow a bunch of weed and now they're coming out and they're like yes where are we selling this at like you know five hundred thousand a kilo and you're like buddy uh i hate to tell you but <laughs> they they did the wrong math <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, I don't know what's going on there, but it's not happening, you know. At 500, you know, it's, you know, no one's buying it, you know. So it's it's, uh, it's interesting to see what's going to happen with people in the market. But I just believe that we're going to see people who love it and the real fire is going to float to the top. The mids will hopefully wash out in Bataya and uh, the people will get bored of it that aren't passionate and... Uh, give it a few years and uh, the market kind of stabilizes, I think we'll see uh, some real, real, real good weed coming out of Thailand. And I think the rest of the world should be worried about Thailand. Because um, if it goes legal here uh, and we can export real quality, like live rosin, oh my God, could you imagine on a world stage like what land race live rosin would be like? I keep telling everyone that I truly believe like Thailand, if it advances like like we're thinking and hoping it is, it will become a weed mecca in the world, truly. Especially on a global stage, people are going to be like, oh, wait, what the fuck? They're doing this over there? Yeah. 
Yeah, and like right now we're already seeing it. I mean, sure we get lots of people from like Canada and America and Europe going to visit uh, Thailand for weed, but really the people coming to smoke are people from the Arab nations. Mm. You know, where it's like very, very deadly in like Dubai and places like that. Japanese, Korean people were in the country. The wheat is really illegal. They come over here. It's man, it's a totally different experience, and uh, it's those markets that I think it's going to be interesting to see as they kind of grab onto the weed culture, how they kind of accept it, or if they don't, and uh, how that's going to reflect on Thailand. So definitely like it's been interesting starting this podcast because we can see like what countries our listeners come from and just like some places like china romania qatar um saudi arabia the united arab Arab emirates i'm like oh so people all around these like countries you wouldn't really expect are interested in what's going on over here oh there's uh, i think uh anyone who's got their eye on cannabis has thought of moving to thailand to grow weed in the last few months. I don't know anyone who I've talked to who I wasn't like, how is it over there, you know? Should should I be thinking about moving to paradise to grow weed? And, and you know, it's a pretty tempting offer for most people. Def- um, definitely. One of our listeners, uh, Jess, who's like, came over to Thailand and she's done like, been in the weed industry here and there. And she's already been like, damn, I need, I should just move here. <laughs> like the levels and like the, what a lot of people have, have said to me and experienced is the embraced the the amount of embracement within the Thai cannabis community is a lot different from like Amsterdam and America. The culture is kind of multi leveled, unlike kind of America, if that makes sense. Oh, uh, Thailand's absolutely embraced the can. I walked by a restaurant today, and I seen it, it was the first thing I've ever seen. We have no weed in the restaurant. <laughs> they had like a free thing on the thing and I was like wow they literally had to list that they had no weed in the restaurant it's become that prevalent most restaurants have a weed section now in the menu whether it's fried leaves or tum yum with the leaf in it or whatever it's it, the culture just went crazy the the shirts in the markets you know everything it, it's yeah, they're loving it. They're loving it. Even roadside. I, I drove to uh, my girl's village to go try to hunt down some of these heirlooms in her village. And on the way there, we've seen roadside shops selling Kratom in joints, pre-rolls, all along. Just little, like, you know, little stalls. Not a shop, you know. And uh, I just thought that was crazy. You know, I never would have thought that just... You know, driving down the road and there's people selling joints roadside. That's true. I love it. It seems like cannabis in Thailand, though, is just kind of like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, when you look at, I mean, you know, it is like a tropical paradise. I mean, it, you know, life can be good here uh, for for a lot of reasons, but I think cannabis is just kind of icing on the cake and it goes perfect. You know, it's just it's like a perfect fit for for this country. I think just the the mentality of most people here and it just goes it just kind of goes together perfect yeah and i mean the idea of sitting on the beach and smoking some fucking absolute fire and watching the sunset and then going out and doing whatever it's uh it's just amazing and especially being a mecca for travelers so people from all over areas that don't have legal cannabis can just like unwind and like see what it's all about and in a way that it's not so harmful and murderous to society it's not meth you know what i mean so it's uh uh, hopefully it kind of opens the eyes because as we see in asia especially in these regions uh it can be pretty dangerous for weed Uh, even you know thailand pre the ninth it's it's kind of weird how it was such a flash in the pan you know you would have gotten a lot of trouble before (laughs) it kind of didn't like say okay okay slowly ease into it it was just snap and now it's all illegal and it's just been like mayhem you know i think about before the ninth there wasn't even like a grow store really you know there was different companies selling products but no real like shop and uh now there's fucking heaps 
you know? And uh, For sure. Yeah. You know, you think about California and Canada, Europe, everywhere, they all have some pre-legalization infrastructure for cannabis, whether it's grow shops, um, you know, just some sort of black market industry, on, you know, where people yeah, California can get some- for- 50 years was r- ready for what happened in California. Yeah. You know, you'd walk in and be like, oh, I've got sick tomatoes or whatever, and the guy would know and whatever. But, you know, there was never anything like that. You know, you say that here, they're like, spray Avid on it. You're like, oh, shit. <laughs> so. <laughs> and, and that's another thing. Uh, I think there needs to be some serious testing put in this place for pesticide use and uh, dangerous chemicals. Because I've seen a lot of pesticide use. Very, very strong, dangerous pesticides. And uh, a lot of this stuff's going right into the shop without being tested. So it's very, very scary to think well, about I think, that. I think this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about like the, the branding side and like the quality control of what would pro- is probably going to come down the pike here soon and it's probably a good thing uh because yeah i mean for what's probably on the market in terms of pesticides use and and everything it's it, i don't even want to know it, it's oh probably, my god it, it's yeah. crazy when like all the things that are illegal back home in like every country that shit's like right on the fucking counter here you know what i mean and I've seen it. You see it. All the little brown bottles. You go to a grow here. I tell you what, you don't see any bugs on that. You start looking for those little brown bottles. All that fucking poisonous, avid bullshit. And uh, I see so many people spraying it, and I get it. You spray it, and it soaks up in the plant. Anything that nibbles on it dies, right? So you get no bugs on that. And it's systemic. It stays in the plant for like 45, 50 days. So people who use that and then harvest plants before that time is up and put it out there, that thing is full of poison, you know? And, and that's very dangerous. So. so so this is kind of a growing question then for you, like, because I've tried to grow some outdoor weed here and it was just, the pests were insane. How are you managing pests without using Paraquat or whatever the hell that poison is. Avid, avid. Uh, so I use a lot of SV Biotech. Um, check out their lineup. They've got very specific bio pesticides for spider mites, um, aphids, thrips, um, caterpillars. Um, wood vinegar is another big one. And just stay and make sure all your plants are healthy. And, and being fed right, organic outside. If it's outside, it's got to be organic. The pests love it if it's salt fed. It just does have no bio defense against the pests. I don't know what it is, but if you know, I find the pests have a harder time attacking anything organic. So just keep everything organic. And uh, yeah, SV Biotech and neem cake in the soil. And yeah, also the season. Like right now, we're just coming out of that cold season into the hot season. You see the spider mites come up out of the dirt. Like this is their time to shine. So you got to be very aware that this is when you wouldn't want to be planting your harvest in these things because it, it's uh, pretty shitty if you go to go to get ready to harvest and you've got like two or three weeks left and you start to see the bugs come in and you can't spray. It's a little bit past your time. It's... Uh, yeah, you got issues at that point. This all, this all just remind me because I was speaking to a few listeners the other day, joking around how quickly I would get like smoked for like taking a cannabinoid um, sensor and equipment around to different places, start just scanning people's buds to see like again like pesticides or whatever. I feel like sadly it'd be quite quickly before someone punches me in the face for Oops. writing them out. <laughs> well, you know, I I, I got a, a friend of mine and. He's pretty knowledgeable. He's, in fact, he's extremely knowledgeable about cannabis. And uh, he was in a group, and he was just pointing out that, hey, like, the photos you're posting of your weed has betrayed us. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Like there's you're, you're clearly showing that your weed is molding. And uh, he's new to Thailand, and it was a Thai grower, and then there's this whole face issue. You can't just put him on blast in front of the group like that. You know, there's ways to go about saying that. But even in Thailand, you're never really allowed to give a bad review. You know what I mean? So it, it'll be interesting to see, like, how you tell someone that their quality isn't what they say it is. Because then you're kind of insulting their product in a way, right? You're telling me it isn't... I don't know. I've always thought that, that it was a weird, weird thing here when it comes to, like, face and the whole concept of quality and and talking about other people's weed. Like, you'll even know if you go eat at a restaurant here, if you sit with Thai people and you ask them, like, how is the food? They'll be like, oh, it tastes really good. It's really good say it loud so everyone hears it and then whisper it like it's not good you know it tastes like shit and uh <laughs> and, and it's a face thing and it's like how how do you like put it out there and be honest with people's quality when it, it can be a, a whole face thing when you're saying hey you know you didn't do this right or you know this is kind of fucked up or you drive it too fast and you got people that are putting a lot of love and a lot of effort into it and it's their first time or second time growing and there's going to be mistakes and it, some people don't take it as nicely as others and it it's a it's an interesting cultural clash when it comes to the different growers trying to teach other foreign people here and Thai people how to do it and what's going on it's it's a clash for sure and interesting, like I said, to see how they'll grade quality while trying to maintain face for everyone. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. For sure. It's going to be interesting. Like like you said, there's a, a lot of Thai people and I think a lot of really Southeast Asian and this kind of side of the world, they take things very personally. It was uh, I've been to Singapore and it's very much the same. Everyone has this kind of ethic of like, well, we're going to tell them it's really good to their face and you'd save face, but, you know, when they're gone away, like you said, they're gone from the table, we're going to kind of shit on them for it. But there's never this, like, yeah. allowed public opinion a lot of the time. And if you do have, like, these public opinions or even semi-public opinions, they do shit on you for it. Hey, I know people who've gotten arrested for giving bad reviews of hotels. <laughs> yeah. So you know, classic. You know, Thailand. saying the hotel was disgusting and blah 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 blah. They're like, hey, we lost business. You know, fucking anyway. Yeah, I know a so guy in I Chiang Mai. Wonder, yeah. I know a guy in Chiang Mai. He was put in Thai prison for for a period of time for calling a bar girl a bitch. <laughs> and no oh, kidding, wow. he got he served hard time for this in Chiang Mai. Uh, yeah. He, yeah, and it was just the wrong person. He thought he could get away with it because it, you know, he thought, oh, it's just a bargle. No, she, yeah, it went very bad for him, and that's just, a, yeah, it's the thing here. Like you just never know, and like if you're, if someone's well connected, you know, it's like you don't know what what they've got behind them in terms of what they could do. It's just, it's, it's weird. Like it's always something in the back of your mind here. When you're giving even simple like giving a critique on something let alone like a like a serious beef you know like even small things it's just it's just strange no definitely like it it gets real crazy and like you say you want to be respectful and you want to say things to them but you want to help them improve so there there becomes a level of like criticism that they, everyone has to be willing to take i shouldn't say you know you know specifically with the tie but the whole cultural thing the face i find is is more valuable than anything you know what i mean they don't give a shit if they they lose the money whatever as long as it's all about saving face so like tying that into their brand and the in into quality again it, it'll be interesting to have people say like oh no this is like low quality and then would that be considered like an insult on face. I don't know. Well, I've thought about uh, this since the beginning. There was a yeah about that. There was a um, I think there and yeah I don't. I'm not gonna like say what line group or anything, but I, I think there was a line group where um, 
there was some talk about bud rot because someone had spotted some bud rot in some pictures or that someone had sent and they said it in the group and they got banned for pointing out something like bud rot which the thing is like i've seen a lot of different weed over the last you know you know what mm-hmm. months or whatever and a lot of it has bud rot and it's like what do you like i'm not gonna buy that you know like it's yeah. is now is that the grower's problem is it something they just overlooked is it intentional it doesn't matter to the the person buying at the end of the day it's just like i'm not gonna buy it you know yeah. uh and it's just one of those things it's it's i think it's hard to manage in thailand because you've got all these weather problems you've got drying and curing problems here that are harder than back home um but at the end of the day i'm not going to buy weed with bud rot you know it doesn't matter like if it offends someone or what i'm just not going to buy it no but there's lots of you know in the then we go back to the whole point we're even here is this is all supposed to be a medical program right so how is is putting moldy weed out on the market like helping people's health how is that like even medicine you know what i mean for sure someone wants to take this and uh you know make rso to help them to you know fight cancer and you're giving them fucking moldy weed well bro come on you know um you get i know guys who've gotten fungal infections from smoking that brick back in the day because it would go moldy in pieces of the brick you know what I mean? Yeah. And depending on what slice you got, you get a big old slice of mold. And then, well, some of these guys would smoke it anyway and make you sick. So the same thing with the bud rot. If someone's giving you rotten weed and you and you get sick, is is that medicine? I, I don't think so. And, I, and, I, and once again, it, it it comes into the quality controls that need to be put into place. You know, just for things like that, which. Uh, you know, it's sad because no one wants to see the freedom. Like, I like it. I think people should be allowed to buy weed wherever they want. You buy it on the side of the road, on the guy selling joints, you should be allowed to do it. Or if you're in a dispensary from a brand name and buying some lab-tested weed, you should be allowed to do that too. And there should be a price point for both of them. And you should be allowed to, as a consumer make your own knowledgeable choice of where you want to buy your weed from. Um, if Thailand can maintain that, I will be very, very happy. You know, mm-hmm. um, the minute they start telling me that we that you can't buy the weed from the guy selling it on the side of the road because you need a lab test because of the health, then, you know, all a lot of the small guys fade away who can't afford the testing, right? And so, in the labs bottleneck it, so you can't even get the shit tested because they all they do is test the big companies' weed, right? Yep. So it's fucking, uh, it's a uh, as many concepts, and I understand why the government uh, has issues talking about it, and it's just crazy to think that they went ahead and just legalized it without kind of working out the nuances. Um, but hey, it'll be it's fun to see the wild ride and to be involved. It's a uh, it's better to have it than to not to have it that's for sure definitely it's it's been an interesting time to see where things are gonna go i think again i want to keep that freedom with everything but then there is going to be that aspect of like well we're either all gonna have to actually get better at this and make sure independently we're all doing quality weed or we're gonna get to like a point where it is in some america places america where only specific people like you said are gonna be getting these lab tests only these certain brands are gonna and so many people will fade away but i think like the beauty of this is how many people have been allowed to do it you know and when you cut that down Mm -hmm. you miss so much of the actual passion and culture of it it just becomes a commodity then oh and it's cool too i tell you if you're a tourist and you're going across country and you pull over at a noodle shop and you're eating the noodles and you're like hey this tastes really good and they're like this is cannabis noodles and they show you the plants they got growing in the back and you can smoke a joint with them with some weed they grew in the yard and shit that's fucking cool you know what i mean mm. and that would never happen if the guy's worried about going to jail he's not going to share that with every guy driving by the house you know what i mean so it'll change thailand openness and and with it but the government is still 
in debate about what's going to happen. Like, I still hear people say, well, it could all disappear overnight. You know, if the government comes and says they don't want it anymore, this new change or whatever that's supposed to happen. And uh, so I'm always worried about that, too, because I don't really follow the politics that deep because that shit scares me. I get anxiety. But, uh, yeah, I hear there's going to be there's some very drastic changes potentially if the government should change so that is, yes. that is a possible anything's possible i think but from it seems already integrated it, like it seems like the 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 steps have been taken to integrate it somehow what the end result is like you know it could go like you know california where you need a million dollars just to get in the business of capital you know, like it could go something like that. It could just be more quality control. It could be something. But I think, dude, we've come to, like it's already all integrated. Like it's there's government departments now for it. I mean, it just seems like it's 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 a done deal. But what the end picture yeah. looks like might be different. But I, I certainly I, hope so. I certainly yeah. hope so. You know, and it, you know, it could just be just hype to keep people from getting involved you know what i mean if you're really not a hundred percent are you really going to put your money down that kind of makes you know the people doing it their risk a little bit bigger a little bit more reward for them you know so or they could be they could be behind the doors figuring out okay you get this slice of the pie you get this slice of the pie you get this slice of the pie (laughs) and i think that's probably more realistic version of what's going on is trying to figure out who gets what and everyone just fighting over the same slice. That's um, kind of what it is, ain't it? That's what it seems like. I think that's the. I think, I think, I think they see what's going on, and I think that's they're just fighting over what who gets the bigger slice right now. That seems to be the what makes the most sense. Yeah, I, I just it makes me sad that I'm always up here in the garden and. Uh, you know, I'm with the plants 24-7. I haven't had a time for a holiday or, or a trip in, in ages. So I really want to get out there and see what the culture has done to these, to these cities like Bangkok and, and Pattaya and Phuket. I mean, I hear all about it, people sending me videos and these things, but I haven't actually got to go and experience any of it. So, What's your, um, what, what's your like, top places you want to go right now? Like if you had... If you could get, like, I'd be, like, infamous, dude. Like, I'll take care of your farm. I won't fuck everything up for two weeks. Oh, gotta... I, I probably, uh, you know, I can't say there's one. I definitely want to do Bangkok. If I had to pick one, probably Bangkok. But Bangkok, Pattaya, Phuket, you know, those are the three hot spots. I think you really need to to hit up. Um, I, yeah. More and more specifically, I think Phuket and and Bangkok, but uh, yeah, I think those three spots are really the the hot spots for the market right now. Um, Chiang Mai too. Chiang Mai's got lots of fire. I shouldn't even say that. You know? Dude, I was gonna say, why are you leaving out Chiang Mai, man? <laughs> you know, I, so the only reason, only reason I haven't said Chiang Mai uh, is because when you look at the the weed maps. Have you seen the map of Phuket and Bangkok when you look at the dispensary thing for, on weed maps and they show you sure. all the little sh- you can't even see the city <laughs> for sure yeah it, it's literally just just pinpoints there's so many shops uh, I mean I, I remember someone saying uh, on my Facebook feed it was like opening new shop and it was a photo of uh of the shop with like an opening now sign and there was like six other dispensaries in the photos on like both sides of the road you know just yeah i hear there's lots so i want to go smoke all their stuff and see what everyone else has got you know i want to see how everyone else's weed tastes for sure man for sure well that's do you gotta hey you gotta take care of yourself too bro you gotta yeah, yeah. this year you gotta do it man you gotta promise that you'll take a trip to bangkok yeah i, I really should and the, it needs to be done and i miss so many things already um but yeah i gotta well that's where this the staff come in too just so i can have a normal life so i can get away from the garden for a few days because someone else can look after it uh i need i need a team 
it's gotten to the point where I need a solid team where I can, you know, direct people and people can be left to their own accord at least for a few days. So that, well, that's where. Really, if anyone's yeah. listening that is in or can go to Burry Ram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need as many hands as we can get out here at the moment. So it's crazy. And, uh, yeah. So I think everyone's having fun right now. Everyone's growing. Everyone's harvesting. Everyone's having a little bit of the the post-sale anxiety of getting their stuff out there. So, uh, but I see so much weed. What are you guys seeing um, for the weed market right now? Like, it's fucking crazy. There's like every stop is full of. I see lots of good weed. I mean, in Chiang Mai, in Chiang Mai, honestly, it's it's we've got 200 dispensaries right now, and there's some good ones in terms of like the vibe of the dispensary and the weed they have, and then there's ones that are total shit. And I'm I'm not gonna say which ones are total shit, but like there's a dispensary called Space Time. Um, it's right in on Nimat, so it's right in the tourist area, and mm. their concept is like, it's just a, it's it. They have a bar, and then it it's like everything is like space themed, so it's it's like you're in space, and I like that because it's like I like dispensaries like that because it's kind of like an experience, you know. Like then there's like mm -hmm. hole in the wall dispensaries where you can just go buy weed, get out, whatever. Then, like you said, there's people on the road, side of the road. There's all of it. There's It's just a mix of everything. So there's, like, the kind of high-end experience if you want to, like, chill with your friends for the evening. You know, um, there's the stuff where it's, like, you can just get in and out that still has good weed. And then there's, you know, the stuff that's just, like, on the side of the road, which, is, you know, has a market, too, like you said before. So Chiang Mai's got a little bit of everything right now in terms of weed quality, um, there's stuff coming up from Bangkok. Um, your stuff's going to be in Chiang Mai. Um, and, yeah, so. Yeah, so, yeah, I need to come up. Last time I was actually in Chiang Mai, I was looking at the Golden Triangle Group's facility before they just fired it up. So that was the last time I was even up that way. It was a while ago. So. Well, we'll get you back, too, man. At least you yeah. or, or your weed. You pick. Yeah, the, weed, the weed's got to go for the weed can okay. meet me there. That's there we sure. go. <laughs> yeah, but you guys got to come visit Brewery Rom too. I'm sure you guys would love to come see the gardens and. Uh, oh, it's on my list, check. dude. It's Brewery yeah. Rom is is high up on my list. I'm gonna get there this year for sure. You know, we've even just been trying to open the shop here. Now, me and my girl, we've got the shop. Um, the only thing in it now is plants. Obviously, we've got the rooms full, but just trying to open it for like a a dispensary where people can just walk in. It just still hasn't even happened yet. Just everything's just been so busy. So, yeah, hopefully we can look forward to that coming up in the next month or so. So, well, keep us posted because we'll um, we'll post that on the on the Instagrams for CM Smoke Sessions when it when it opens um and we, we can have you back anytime you know when you've got yeah. the time i know you're you busy guys, man. i've seen it too you guys have had some uh some pretty killer guests on yoda can grow he's killer how, i've um, had his weed too yeah cannabis That's, major dude yeah how you ever say the major he's got the fire so For sure. yeah um is there any other people on the list here that we can be excited to see coming up here sita I mean, uh, one good guest that I know will be interesting will be revolving around the uh, Cannabis Cup that just happened, so that will be a, a little bit of an interesting insight to what's to come. I just like yeah. to tease the listeners. I'll be in the, <laughs> yeah, yeah it'll be interesting to see. I, you know, to me, it just seemed like it was like a super fast event. Like, I seen everyone post and they were there, and then it was like over. It was just, I don't know, if it was just, like, must have just been a one-day event, was it? So Yeah, it, to me, it was really interesting to see how many people were there. And, like, I was watching the live stream and stuff, and there was quite, like, it was busy. And it was quite interesting to see, like, finally, because, I mean, we had the Thai High convention up north. that w It was busy, but this was kind of, like, odd to see, you know, they had a full conference room set out, cameras, they had... 
um, like they were zooming in on all of the weed on a massive screen. So it's really, really kind of interesting to see that kind of more westernized concept come to Thailand, I guess. Yeah, that is very cool. And uh, I would have been interesting to see how they actually did the judging and uh, how they put that together. So, you know. I'm going to have to line up all the judges as guests. (laughs) Yeah, that's going to be an interesting conversation, I think, because there was some some stuff that went into that, wasn't there, Sita, like in terms of uh, like how the judging was going to go and the flower that they were using. I think there's going to be some interesting uh, bits of information about that. Yeah, there was definitely uh, many different types of talks going on, let's just say, and different members of the community <laughs> having discussions in certain ways. <laughs> and you're, you, you, you're, 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 that's so vague, but yeah. We, uh, hey, we just had a twi- People were talking about stuff in tones that could be described as not genuine. <laughs> hey, we had a whole 20 minute segment about saving face. <laughs> yeah yeah i get it i get it no no but uh yeah uh i remember we were in canada and we did one cannabis cup and the way i always saw it and this was the best ever you got your bags and they were all numbered you know a1 b2 whatever and you got your score cards and then you everyone went off smoked their weed however they wanted to come back and they put in their ballots and then they would have, a, you know, a grand vote in the end where they counted out each set of ballots, and then they would announce what weed was what. So it would be like A1 was grown by Infamous Gardens, B2 was grown by Bill, you know, and they would say who the winner was. But you really didn't know anything about the weed until it was all graded. And uh, I think that's important, especially when there's, like, you're trying to make things fair in between like where people may have bias yeah so. you have to you have to do a blind test with something like that if mm-hmm. it's a yeah for sure for sure um yeah that's that's a hundred percent the prizes too were big i i mean for yeah they were no joke i had no idea they were going to be that big yeah yeah so that's interesting for sure um who else is are we going to have this guest see to Oh man, you We've want got... to just spoil stuff? Yeah, kind of. I'm cu- I'm curious. Oh, okay. Well, like a, a good friend of mine, Ricky from Fat Buds, we'll be having him on soon. He is a very interesting character. So again, okay, like so if you want to dispensary wanna... owner, yeah, yeah in yeah, Bangkok. Yeah, that's definitely one place you should check out in Bangkok. Infamous, if you get there. Yeah, there's. I'm just gonna say there's a few names of certain shops that have uh, always seemed to pop up. And Fat Buds is one that always seems to manage to get their names out there amongst the thousands, you know? Um, so I definitely sure. think that shop's one of the top better ones, you know? You know, so I think the ones, you know, Sakum Weed, obviously, I can't believe I haven't been there yet. Um, you know, I got a lot of respect for Bear and stuff, so I want to see what his shop's all about. Kitty Shop. Yep. You know, I want to see all the people that were... I don't know who had who deserve who I think were like I was waiting to have shops and now have shops. I'm more excited to go see theirs. You know, mm. the what's the other one by Puff the Ganjana or something? Ganjana, yeah. Um, Ganjana, yeah. So yeah. those those are kind of the places I want to visit. Um, uh, it's interesting to me to to see the players that were involved before and and what's going on now after and seeing how everyone's took their game to whatever level they've decided to go. So it'll just be nice to go see all people that are also busy now with their new success to just go say hi. So that's kind of what's on my agenda for going and looking around. Because everyone, I think, has got fire, those guys. They Everyone I just mentioned knows good wheat, so... If you know the owner knows good weed, there's no doubt there's going to be fire in the shop. For sure, definitely, man. Speaking of it, did you, have you guys had any of the cookies weed? Uh, I haven't. I've seen. I know people who have, but I haven't, and I doubt Bill has all the way up in the north. Uh, no, I haven't yet. No. It is something definitely. So. I kind of want to check out, even though I'm again. People call me the cookie hater. I I kind of want to check it out just for, you know. 
doing like checking out these different kind of things and the different level of stuff is how you learn a lot more about the whole community and the industry so it would be interesting to see now we did have a guy on the podcast who's down in, in Hatia who uh, got a cookies tattoo that day on his he, he, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah it's an interesting community yeah so there's all it takes a whole bunch of people to make the world go around right it's all so, types that's right you know that's right and uh, you know I, I've actually had this conversation about cookies um, with a few different people and, and there's lots of different opinions especially when you consider like burner as the as the spearhead but I think if you actually look at like cookies as like a weed company strictly they always go in and pretty much buy local weed right mm. so if you want to like hate on cookies you can't hate on them for really being like a corporate cannabis company even though some of their white labels may be pretty big mega factories of weed but um they do in, in many cases buy from a lot of small small growers and things like that too so um there isn't all pure hate but i think anything that gets to any level of corporatism kind of loses soul with people who liked it before it was mainstream so but i want to see thailand develop its own brand that can go to california vice versa shit that can be in canada that's like infamous gardens bro you know infamous gardens is infamous name. gardens yeah um <laughs> i'd love to um i don't do enough work with the land race um i would really if i had a millions and millions of dollars and all the time in the world i would take on some more land race breeding projects but it's a lot of work um for anyone who's ever grown the thai hang lock stuff yeah it, it's a lot of work so we had yeah first that's what i was trying to grow we had um uh zomia on uh the zomia collective uh what was his name see brandon what's his name he's a cool yeah. guy too he's got yeah him. yeah we had yeah he's he's very knowledgeable on the land race stuff like super educated uh that was a really interesting conversation for sure but yeah he's really cool um yeah i like what he's doing he made that map which i still use to this day that has all the different aspects of the different regions and what they grow Mm, yeah. which i think is really cool if you if you haven't seen that but yeah the thailand race is very cool i think that's kind of the ace of thailand's sleeve if they use it right and they don't lose it um because it's you know it'll only take a few years of all this western pollen floating around to dilute the genetic pool and have all these heirlooms lost forever so i think it's only a matter of time before we lose them in any way but how quick they go will be up to Thailand. But if they can get them and, and make something new that can be grown in Thailand that can't be grown anywhere else, that's just absolutely phenomenal, I think that's where Thailand will succeed, you know. Because it's hard to grow uh, a 12-week sativa anywhere outside in the world, you know. For sure, Thailand definitely has this. And I, I tend to a lot. It's just a special climate, sp this different type of weed. That, I mean, the initial phases of everything that's happened is like people are kind of focused on the Western strains and stuff. But then, it, I think the intrigue, more commonly, is going to be like, let's just fuck around with these land races a little bit and see what we can get. Because you know we've we've dabbled with Western genetics for fucking years now, and we've kind of got like a whole new palette on the table. And we just need to wait for people to start cooking. People to start cooking, yeah. Yeah, but, you kind you of know, broke up there at the end, Sita. Oh, right, sorry. God damn it, internet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, yeah, have you heard ahead. of Chana Thai Seeds? Yes, he That's, is another person yeah, I'm yeah, very yeah. interested to get on the podcast. Uh, well, I'll talk to you. He'll be more than interested. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, I've worked with him for quite some time. Uh before the ninth in fact all the different projects we would use his seeds and i mean for his for outdoor it it really is a next level having the the epigenetics he's done all of his breeding pretty much in thailand in full sun yeah so everything that he's got whether it's western or his thai mixes 
all has that Thai epigenetics and that that's something you can't get out of a seed pack no matter how fire it is you know what I mean compounds genetics when you put it outside in Thailand is not going to perform as well as anything that was bred in Thailand you know what I mean indoors is a different situation indoors is the same everywhere but outdoors um, Thailand has a very crazy hot environment that runs very specific stuff to do well and it's going to take a few generations for everyone cooking making different things to see what comes out canatized one guy who does really great work but now that there's you know I imagine millions of people doing it now um, the chances of these a large number of good strains coming in with these Thai mixes is there that's pre cookie pre dilution we'll say which could open up the floodgates to whole new flavor profiles in cannabinoids but um see that's see and that's the whole unique thing about Thailand and why you know there's such a big opportunity here not just for like you know the business side but just for what could be done with cannabis and taking it to the next level like it, there could be some innovations that happen here like you said like you know finding different you know growing that you know is producing you know different cannabinoid profiles and terps that are like hard to find or you know whatever that is whatever ends up being there's just all this potential kind of in thailand right now yeah and especially like i said the growing season uh, being able to do stuff and not worrying about it like freezing you know what I mean that's like even now when it's like super hot and got bugs I mean we can we compare it to the off season in Canada when it's like snowfall there's absolutely nothing happening you know what I mean but here if you love to grow and you really don't care you can make a plant suffer outside you know so um, it's a good spot for people who grow they can try and switch up their different strains, their different varieties the different parts of the year to see what does well um, to form their strategies for how they're going to grow and because even where it is sunny and everything all year round um, uh, I'm getting ready for the last of my home harvest we're like harvesting the last of my homely outdoor right now so getting ready before the heat and the rain kicks in and that'll be the end of my houses outdoor. And then for the, the living soil beds, we'll be harvesting them in the next two to three weeks. Everything's coming down. And, um, yeah, the other outdoor locations come down already. So, like, yeah, the outdoor season's pretty much a wrap now. So, so what you've got coming up next in terms of harvest that's going to be ready for people, like, the Duke Nukem is oh, one. All the stuff that's, all the outdoor that's come out, everything is just getting trimmed, cured, and labeled and dealt with. The, the absolute issue now is dealing with just the onslaught of, of strains and varieties and phenos. So just trying to get everything organized is, is a whole process. I totally get why some people just do two or three and keep it as is. Um, and sometimes just doing a few of each plant is extremely irritating when you're doing such large numbers. So, but it was fun. It was fun. So, yeah, what's coming up? So that's coming up. You can look for all that. That's the sun-grown craft stuff. All really terpy. Sun, you know, full flavor. Tons of different flavors. Classic flavors like Romulan, Duke Nukem got candy shop crosses in there um, yeah there's a whole bunch of stuff go check it out uh, then there's coming up the new indoor will be online probably in another two months and again a whole bunch of new flavors there there's going to be the one hitter quitter the royal games uh, if you're into land race there's going to be the Kandahar Maroof Red from I think that's like Pakistan or Afghanistan or something. Yeah, but uh, so that's going to be interesting. Um, some more Wilson from Masonic, and then uh, yeah, then there's a, another wave after that that is Humboldt and Ripper and 
a whole bunch of my varieties coming out, uh, the Red Circle, the Hyperspace. We're going to be digging through that, trying to find some keepers. So, yeah, exciting. Lots of plans. So let's just keep moving it forward and see well, how things like roll out, you know. Keep pheno fishing. <laughs> see if the fire is in there, you know. I always just describe it like rolling dice. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't, you know. And sometimes it can be a little bit disillusional when you don't keep the ones you should have kept and kept the wrong ones and then, you know, I don't know. I find the whole pheno selection thing for the market kind of crazy because I'm personally always trying to pump out the new, new. You know, I'm always trying to put out something new. Um, a couple bags for me and that's enough. I don't care if I ever see it again. But dealing with these dispensaries, a lot of them want to maintain a menu. Hmm day to day to day so they want to be able to call up and get that Duke Nukem every single time mm -hmm. they want to be able to call up and get the, the gas face every single time and it's just like sometimes it's just like hey we gotta let certain stuff go keeping a balance of getting new stuff and letting old stuff go that's been a challenge for me because I'm just like want everything out get new stuff in and people are like wait a minute wait a minute we want to smoke more of that old one and <laughs> like, oh my god that's what happened to the gas thing so i'm like all right pull all the farms i'm like no more gas face and then everyone was like no we want more gas things and it's just like what the fuck okay keep the gas face yeah so. that was that was me and my my buddy's reaction to modified grapes we're like okay this is the one like uh, we hope he gets has a lot more of <laughs> yeah yeah modified grapes is funny there's certain ones that i always think are going to be the bangers and it's like always not the modified grapes is like one that was like yeah i was never big on grapes just the whole grapes whole flavor just never ever did it for me but that modified grapes is fucking a banger and uh the gas face again i didn't think was going to be as good but it was really banging and the gas cakes which I really like. I don't know if you got some of that. I don't that think so. Stuff, yeah, that's yeah, that's really really good. But I've had that on the menu, so that's gone now. That's after that last harvest, we pulled it, and I was just like mentioned it to a bunch of people. It was like we still got that gas face. They're like what? <laughs> it was one of the first strains I had since like everything came out. So it's like yeah, it's gotta go. Basically, it's the chef's menu with you, dude. Like it's it's chef's fucking menu like you get what the chef has <laughs> <laughs> yeah well sometimes like you know I, I i'm like a little bit busy sometimes so people are like oh dude the worst is photos people message me and they're like bro can you send me a photo of the weed i'm like bro i, I really i can't because it's it's in a bag in a filing cabinet in the cold room you know what i mean uh it, it takes a good 20 30 minutes just to find the weed and then I got to pull it out, and now you want me to take the photos of, like, ten different types? No. So, yeah, that's where it gets a bit Trust crazy. Trust the chef. Trust the chef. Yeah, and I tell you what, I've never had anyone complain and not come back, so. That's right. Um, you know, and when I was growing up, there used to be two types of weed. Take it or leave it, you know? So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because that's not the case now, and I think that the days of the of anyone being any type of minimalistic service provider is way over. I mean, now no, it's, it's buyer's choice to, now. It's buyer's. I mean, oh my god! I remember like even talking to my friends back in Canada now, and I'm talking about like live resin and these things and pens, and they're showing me the packaging, and it's just unreal like a box in a box in a box with a container with it everything is so elaborate and it looks so nice and so clean like he was showing me a pre-roll and you would have thought the guy was buying an iphone you know the boxing was so similar and i was just like wow you know no more no more uh getting weed and, and film the spencer capsules you know or the top of a cigarette pack, like the plastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <fuck. laughs> yeah. 
Well, if anyone knows, there's a, a street where people like to walk on. Back in the day, you used to be able to get these little packets. I guess that has changed now. There used to be these little packets you used to be able to get there. And that used to be where you get your smoke when you were on holiday. And it used to be a hundred baht for a little packet. And it was just sure. the brownest, dirtiest, shittiest swag. And now I just think about what type of weed you'd get down there now. I bet you it's fire. Fire's choice, man. That's right. Yeah. You know, all the pretty, you know, in reality, Thailand, it, it'll be the world's capital for weed. Like you said, it'll be the Mecca. If no other country in the region takes off, like every backpacker in the world is going to want to come here. It'll re reemerge Thailand as a tourist superpower, in my opinion. For definitely, sure. For definitely. sure. Well, uh, I know you've probably got a lot going on there at the household uh, there, my friend, but um, I think we had a good episode here. Um, I'm sorry if I rambled a bit much. I do no, have man. ADHD, so I can fucking go off on <laughs> tangents. <laughs> no, man, it was good. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's uh, yeah, call this a rabble. Let's put a bookmark on it, because... We'll love to have you back, man, when, when you've got all your uh, farm dialed in with staff and, and everything. And then when you open your new shop, uh, you're always wow. welcome back. Uh, and, uh, yeah, soon in Chiang Mai, we'll have your, your stuff. I'll, I'll talk to you privately about that um, yeah, off, cool. off the pod. But, um, yeah, anything else, Sita, we've got? Uh, everyone go buy Infamous's weed so this guy can have a holiday, please. He deserves it. <laughs> Go to your dispensary, ask if they have infamous gardens weed, and that's all you got to do. That would be nice. Uh, if you have any questions, please just hit me up on a DM on Instagram. Follow the Discord if you want to like talk about growing and show me some pictures. Um, if you're in Thailand and you're listening and you want to grow any of my strains, send me a DM. Um, I'll hook you up with seeds. Just take care of the shipping mention the podcast or whatever so anyone who's a listener in thailand free seeds uh just make sure you're willing to pay the 50 baht for shipping or whatever and uh we'll get you a few packs so so that's yeah it. that's something too that infamous sent me a while back um and so yeah that so that offer stands for people in thailand well, yeah, I, I didn't say this, but before, I actually used to give away seeds like crazy. I think I've given away over 100,000 seeds that I've bred personally over the years. So people want seeds. If you want something specific, we will always work something out. If you just want to grow something by me, I'll always make sure you get some fire in your hands. So, yeah. That's See, awesome, man. Thank you. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> This, yeah, this is the culture right here, man. This is yeah. Well, it. when I when I first came, we were talking about genetics. Yeah, and uh, nobody had genetics. It was hard to get good fire, and so um, I just made seeds. We had a few packs, and I just kept making seeds and giving them out. And we would go to different little things here, like the Burry Rum Three Sixty, and just give out seeds. So. Um, I, I just maintain that even though it's still legal, uh, it doesn't hurt to give out seeds. Everyone should be growing. So, you know, overgrow the issues. Awesome, man. Well, that's a good way to end it. Um, so, yeah, pre really appreciate the time, man, uh, especially, you know, for everything you've got going on. Uh, we'll be in touch, and we'd love to have you back. So we'll call it a wrap. All right, then. Thanks a lot, guys. Awesome, right, man. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.